So in the same way, uh, in distant healing, you can use two methodologies. One where you as if hold the other person in your consciousness and do what you have to do. In which case you are not there, but you've created a link which does something. The other way is you actually put yourself out there and you're not here and you do your thing there. Now both have their advantages and disadvantages. But the one where you go out there can of course be much more uh, direct in its impact. Even you can materialize, you, if you have the skill, to materialize your vibration to a degree that the other person feels it materially. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's also possible. They usually come and smell more often. People yeah. can smell you. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is the sense of being watched yeah. also. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And there's a third variation which is a partial between these two. Is where you create a formation and release it. Okay. And the formation goes out and does it. And you may not need to track it. And then you can check once in a while what's the state of that formation. Mm -hmm. Kind of psychic drama. Yes. <laughs> okay, so from a Western point of view, in your in your view, um, what is the most correct approximation in physics that explains what you just described in this community? Is there one at all? Are they all just completely incorrect? And if they are incorrect, why? Are there ones that you think are more correct to explain? Most that? of them are reductionist. Mm -hmm. Because they start with the reverse side that matter produces consciousness. Mm -hmm. And until you accept consciousness as independent of matter and uses matter, mm -hmm. you don't really get the full access to this uh, understanding or access to this. Mm -hmm. Once you accept that, then it doesn't matter. Top what did you do? You, yeah, you right. sent your consciousness there, you pushed yourself there, you sent a drone. These are all variations of mm -hmm. consciousness acting on consciousness. We, you were saying yesterday how entanglement is a fallacy because it's basically a materialist mm -hmm. view. It's, it's a reductionist view. Mm -hmm. In fact, the whole uh, EPR paradox about this particle separation still remaining connected, which has been tested supposedly. And the trick in that whole thing is the apparatus you set up itself is creating the link. Like what you spoke about that the spider wave. So, how, then when you look so at what we were discussing yesterday, I don't know. If was that there is already a link. Everything is already linked. Yes. What we are doing when we set up these uh, apparent links is highlighting an existing link. Because everything is held is an, in an underlying oneness. Okay. It is an expression of the same oneness. So if the delayed, with the delayed choice experiment, mm -hmm. where they had the particles and one was set up in an obstacle course, mm -hmm. and then it didn't arrive until after particle a had gone through. Particle A changed wave or particle after particle B went through. So the entanglement, yes, has happened, but that that is an unknown. Uh, it's just you don't know, but in the setup of the experiment itself, there's a whole pattern of waves that have linked the whole space. So in what we, what we yeah. described yesterday as the pilot waves. Yeah, I, I think, I think the, the pilot wave model of de Broglie resolves some of these apparent paradoxes. In an EPR, einstein pedowski rosen type experiment, we need a very rarefied environment and the phase is correct and all of this in order to observe this underlying entanglement. Um, in the pilot wave model of de Broglie, which was cast aside historically in quantum mechanics, but is experiencing some resurgence now, you have a connection between all the points in space that's guiding the particles in a deterministic fashion. Mm -hmm. Rather than a kind of invisible entanglement, it's beginning with a holistic model where the distance from me to you is already zero because it's all part of the same set of possibilities. So Let me give you a picture, so visual picture. Okay. Imagine every atom or molecule is vibrating and sending out ripples in the underlying ether. Mm -hmm. We're assuming there's an ether. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And now the moment you've set up an experiment, mm -hmm. every wall and every particle is vibrating, setting up wave patterns, mm -hmm. creating interference patterns. Mm -hmm. And within the interference patterns, there are standing waves or standing yes. troughs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You put a particle, it's going to flow along the trough. Exactly. And this is and the path has been set by the experiment yeah. that you set up. Because yeah. the yeah. experiment has wait, set up. Wait, wait, wait. And, and, <coughs> and the single slit That's and double, this double slit experiment, whether you send yes. one particle or a yeah. wave, is resolved by this. Okay, I understand that that makes sense to me. The why would a particle A change based on particle B after the fact? 
It's because this resonance is present. Uh, for example, a simple, simple model is a single a double slit experiment. And so you start with one single slit. You'll set up this set of standing waves that will give you a single slit diffraction pattern. Yeah. Let's say that we add a second slit, that changes the overall environment and the right. particles will follow those waves. Right. So there's a resonance set up by the possibilities that are present in the apparatus. But it suggests that particle B would have an influence over particle A. Why? No, that's the reductionist mind. Because time is also entangled. Like yeah, that's just that. the spatial entanglement. Yeah. We <laughs> so there's an influence already in the way it's set up. Yes. When the particle crosses this threshold, it undergoes a shift because of the patterns which are different. And this becomes very interesting because we, we speak about spaces where meditation has occurred, where uh, significant spiritual people have lived, where healing has occurred, where it's easier to access things. Like here. Like here. And perhaps this is related to this model that we see in a very rarefied context in the double slit experiment or the delayed choice or einstein badowski rosen experiment that we see in these practices that people engage in that makes healing more possible. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will give you a model which will amplify on this idea. What holds in a space the sacredness or the vibe of that sacred event? Uh, every grade of consciousness is substantial. We must not view consciousness in abstraction. It is substance. So there are many grades of substance of consciousness. Mm -hmm. When you bring down a very high grade of consciousness, and imprint it into this substance. It's like it's soaked in like sponge. Mm -hmm. And as long as that imprint remains, you will feel it in that space. Mm -hmm. You can also drive it out, and then the space becomes empty. Mm -hmm. If it's a high consciousness fitted into a physical substance, it doesn't have much to grip on, it will dissipate after a while. Mm -hmm. But if I have accumulated many gradations in between, then it's got a grip on a layer, layer closer to it, which has got a grip layer to a layer closer to this, which has got a grip on this matter, and the whole chain stays intact. Mm -hmm. And that's how you build a sacred space. Mm -hmm. Entering that space, it's like all these high gradations of consciousness are resonating and triggering within me the awakening of those levels. This is how temples have been built. Exactly. This is what chanting Consecrated takes place. Spaces. Once you think of it in this yeah. way, you have a whole technology you can develop and build. Right. Mm -hmm. Temple, temples are ancient technology. Right? Exactly. Absolutely. So they had processes, and sometimes they used physical processes which required nothing from you, except a good intention. So they would use materials such as milk and honey and uh, uh, to, to be put yeah. on the, to be bathed on the idol. Yeah. And you'll say, what a waste. No, they're accessing the particular grade of vibration, yes. which they're building through layers, yes. in order that it can have a capacity to hold the higher thing which is brought in. Wait, 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 wait. So milk, <coughs> turmeric, these are all used? To build, huh? to, to bring a certain vibration, okay. which then stays attached in layers. So, for example, the priest is putting the vibration in that substance. It's not necessarily um, the no, substance so itself. No, the, the substance, substance. Uh, it's, the the substance, substance itself. itself. So it's like a note in music. Oh, okay. Okay. Each substance has a particular quality because it is vibrating in that grade mm -hmm. of consciousness. Yes. No so milk is holy, turmeric is holy. holy. All, oh, yes, all the plants, the, the flowers, flowers making everything. Yeah. Everything is holy differently. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So how you layer it builds that particular base of which can like sponge hold that highest thing which will be called now. Now for that highest thing you still need the human being for that access. Yes. So that's where the priest and his purity is important and the process they use. So they did one recently, they have to renew the power in the temple every 12 years, mm -hmm. most temples. So they had one recently at the Ganesh temple here, some years ago. I went there, they had all these, you know, the fire pits and all that. And Ganesh representing all these facets of consciousness or powers of his action, each of these is described as a, as a tool or a weapon. So they had separate pits for separate tools or parts of his consciousness. And I asked the priest to explain what he does. He said, oh, here we pull this, here we pull this. And it's invoked and then it's all accumulated into the big pot of the center mm -hmm. through water. Water is the carrier. Yeah. And then once it's all accumulated and you have the complete person, yes. then so then we transfer it to the idol. I said, how do you do that? We carry it on our head. And when you carry it on your head, you lose all consciousness of yourself. Now it's only that deity which is you. Uh. It leads you. And then there's a process of transferring it now into the idol. Mm -hmm. 
which has been sufficiently prepared. So I said, what does it feel like when you take it on your head? So there were two priests. They both looked at each other and smiled mysteriously. <laughs> and then one of them said, it feels like the sun is lit up within you. Uh, <laughs> did you get to carry it on your head, or is it only the priest that No, I think he gets to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see, the experience itself we have had in other ways. Sure. The point is you can go directly. Right. So the, obviously, this is a method given to people who don't have access to the higher consciousness. Yeah. So you follow the routine, you get it. Right. But a saint or a spiritually developed master does not need any of this. He is the link. Right. So he accesses, brings down, imprints, yes. work done. Yes. You don't need any of the paraphernalia of this. I, I agree. You can discard it completely. Yes. The mechanism or the technology was given so that we could access without yes. having this. So you see the Matri Mandir, for example, no rituals, no nothing. Yeah, exactly. The mother space. said, build it, your and space. I take it upon myself mm -hmm. to make it one of the most powerful spiritual centers in the world. That was her promise. Okay. Well before it was built. <laughs> right. And then she brought that into it. So the last thing I want to ask for, say, on this delayed choice experiment, because what I have likened it to is the process of healing. Mm -hmm. So you can take today's mind to an old problem that you've had, particle A, particle B, and you can overlay the thinking, the mature mind, the, the new discoveries that you've made in the times that, that hasn't been there, and you can imprint yourself with a new experience of that and change, change the physical, change that that's the transmutation, that's the transformation of the cells part with a new, new mindset, with a, a new idea. So that's how I have put it together in my own work. I don't work. see why you even need that. I you think of consciousness as substance. Because in a PhD you program, you have, to re <laughs> 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 you have to make some sort of sense of why are you making this correlation. That's the gymnastics you need to conform uh, yeah. to thought patterns. But if you think of the consciousness purely as substance, yeah. it is substantial, you can invoke and imprint. Exactly. And everything changes. But sometimes people need a method in order to be able to do it, which is what you were just saying. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is this. If in myself I've developed a grade of consciousness and a skill within that grade, let's say like a piano mm -hmm. in the hands, mm -hmm. and in the hands I've created a consciousness which is almost intuitive that my hands can feel and flow mm -hmm. with the music without my conscious participation, mm -hmm. that imprint is there in the consciousness of the hands. It's rich, it's valuable. It's possible to transfer it to another. Not just give it up, but imprint it like, and the imprint is there in the other person. Yes. You replicated it. You can imprint your skill, essentially. The catch is on the other side, the person should have a receptivity and the ability to retain what he receives. Yes. If you think about this as the best way of teaching or learning, mm -hmm. you will find in the Indian tradition of music or most of the arts. The first training of this disciple or the student is develop receptivity, mm -hmm. complete obedience, complete transparency of ego, mm -hmm. so that when you are ready, the master goes yeah. and you have it. That's transmission, essentially. Transmission. That's transmission. Transmission. Yes. I think there's a, there are some some more perhaps mundane ways of working it as well. And in some Indian styles of musical pedagogy, you play follow the leader. Yes. Uh, you imitate yes. the, what the leader does. Yes. But after some time, you begin to anticipate. Mm -hmm. Then you go back to your room and you try to retain. And there's a, a process of transmission. Yes. It's not all at once, but it's a gradual that's the, that's the form in which one sees the process. Now, what's yeah. happening behind? Watch very carefully. When I'm imitating you, what do I do? In my consciousness, I'm trying to feel you mm -hmm. and imprint mm -hmm. myself from you. Mm -hmm. You cannot imitate if you don't do that too. Right? So you're actually transmitting mm -hmm. unknowingly yes. by trying to do something which to you is accessible. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't have that link, you would never learn it. Mm -hmm. So there's this big drama around the, uh, what are those mirror cells in the brain? Yeah. 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 But what if it's nothing to do with neurons? It's mm -hmm. the part of the consciousness which, while looking at someone else, automatically identifies and absorbs the imprint. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only way to learn. There is no other way to learn. Except it's happening at a subliminal level, you are not yeah. conscious, you think you are learning by imitating. 
No, you're learning by tuning. But you need to have enough oxytocin in order to be able to even do it. What is oxytocin? It's the vibration of affinity. Exactly. And love yeah. and identification. That's exactly. all. That's what amplifies the imprint. Agreed. So I would put it the other way. I would say attune your consciousness and connect the oxytocin level should Go on. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's rather a side effect of the consciousness yes. connecting. I agree. It's just some people feel that they don't have that mirror neuron ability mm -hmm. mirror neuron ability and it's maybe they yeah. it's something to do with neuron, it's your consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> well I think something has to do with the relationship with the teacher. If there's a compassion if there is an affinity in compassion, yeah. etc. All that yeah. helps. Yes. But still all of these are vehicle by which you transmit. Yes. But the second requirement remember you should be able to receive and you should be able to retain. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it evaporates after. I had this wonderful experience and it's gone. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hold it. Mm -hmm. So I want to now take, make a radical shift to what I wanted to touch upon. And I will maybe just for today we'll stop with this idea of the Vedic science. Yes. And one key idea of the basis of Vedic science. You see, in all of current science, the focus is on structure, which gives rise to properties. When molecules are structured like this, the molecule behaves like that. Mm -hmm. When the atom has so many electrons, mm -hmm. it has this property. Mm -hmm. You change one more electron and the property changes completely. Yes. And you can ask yourself what's the link with the number of electrons and the property and you find no link at all. You add one more electron, it becomes a gas. You remove one electron, it becomes a something else. Mm -hmm. You take two objects like hydrogen and oxygen, join them, and you get a substance which has nothing in common with either hydrogen or oxygen. So this approach of understanding reality through structures having qualities does not help you, it's arbitrary. When the Vedic scientists Rishis, <laughs> went deep into reality to understand it, what they discovered was structure is a phenomenon of quality. The underlying reality of quality. The underlying reality is quality of energy or consciousness, which to you appears as a structure. Now let's say you have an electron. How do you know it's an electron? Because when I send another electron to it, it bounces off with this force. When I send a proton to it, it attracts with that force. I don't, I never know what the particle is. I know only how it interacts with what I sent to it. In other words, all I know of it is the bundle of qualities it expresses. I have created in my mind a picture of a structure mm -hmm. based on the qualities it emanates. Mm -hmm. But that's an artificial creation. It's unreal. Mm -hmm. The reality is mm -hmm. the quality which is the subject. Mm -hmm. The quality of what? Energy. And even that, the quality is based on some interaction with something else. We know it by interaction. But yeah. otherwise the quality is intrinsic. Mm -hmm. okay? <coughs> but it is quality of the energy bundle that it is. Now what is energy? And again, you go one step deeper, energy is consciousness. It's energy of consciousness. So it is conscious energy. All energy is conscious energy, which means you can enter into the conscious energy and from within warp its energy imprint. Change the quality from inside out. That means I could take material which is iron, enter into its energy consciousness imprint and warp it to become a different pattern of energy of uh, quality and it appears to you as gold. This is alchemy. That's the basis of alchemy. That's what you were discussing earlier in healing. Mm -hmm. You enter into it and change the consciousness or imprint a new consciousness which becomes now your new yes. template of consciousness. Yes. When you now start thinking in terms of quality as first and structure as secondary, mm -hmm. this becomes the most natural way of change. Agreed. But as long as you thought your body is structure giving rise to quality, then to heal, you have to change the structure, which is impossible. Right. <laughs> but when you see it as quality giving rise to appearance of structure, then to heal, you just have to change the consciousness from within, and the structure will change instantaneously. And it will not be a miracle. It will be just the change of consciousness of the energy imprint. So this is the starting point of the whole Vedic science. Now with this, we can approach physics, we can approach healing, and you'll see how it changes the whole uh, paradigm. You go deeper now, what is the nature of this bundle of qualities that anything comes out? What are there certain things like essential qualities? Now the word for quality is guna. If you go deep into it, you will find all 
pattern of quality behavior can be broken down into three essential gunas or three essential qualities. When you push at me, when you come to touch me, I can either offer passive resistance, I do nothing, I'm immobile, that's the first tamas guna, okay, inertia. Or I can proactively push back or deflect, so I'm exercising an energy or an action, so that's the rajas guna, the kinesis. Or I can enter into balance, and that's the sattva guna. There are no other. All quality, however sophisticated, however complex, is a combination of these three. Now, if you take any complex behavior and reduce it to a pattern of these three in some complex relationship, you can operate on these three separately and change the overall pattern. If you can get into this pattern, which is so complex of a molecule, get into it and increase the rajas guna, suddenly the whole molecule becomes hyperactive and is able to do stuff which was not part of it. And to the observer, you'll say, ah, suddenly this structure changed, the molecule shaped itself, or it did a loop and its quality changed. But you're trying to interpret structure producing quality, it makes no sense. Whereas the other way, it makes enormous sense. And then with this, you can now explain so many phenomena and why so much importance is given to intrinsic quality of things. So they will look at, a, in Ayurveda, they look at some materials and say, this is cooling and that is heating, that's the quality intrinsic to it. If you try to study which molecule does the cooling or heating, it's not obvious. <laughs> Rather, if you capture the, the heating or cooling quality, you can now play with the molecular structures without changing that and still retain that he heating or cooling quality. It goes into your stomach and inside it heats up. I don't know how. <laughs> so you forget structure and start thinking in terms of quality first. I think that much of what you're discussing is beginning to be put into words in Western systems biology. Mm -hmm. The notion that the behavior of a system, yeah. the, the emergent properties that occur are greater than the sum of the parts. And this is a very interesting result for us because when we began historically in science, we wanted to understand how all the parts fit together and explain and most importantly predict the outcomes from that. And in systems biology, again, we're confronted with this incredible complexity. But all of this comes from the original origin of science, looking at matter as prior, and quality yeah. emerging out exactly. of structure. Exactly, And now we are being forced. Having gone deep enough, you have to In biology in particular, yes. but also in, in nanotechnology yeah. and so forth. So now when you look at the human body, instead of looking at the physical heart as a structure, you look at the bundle of energy quality that it represents, yeah. which works through this structure, Modify the energy pattern, and you find the structure changes as a ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And it's far easier to modify the energy pattern yes. than to modify <laughs> the structure, which involves operating surgery. And this also implies a different way of doing science. A different set of expectations. Different. You have to think different. Yeah. And I think an entirely different behavior, because our science has primarily focused on predictability and control. Mm -hmm. And these two <laughs> components uh, must change dramatically with this kind of focus. But what it's telling us is we need a very different way to look at the body in healing, that the body is, it doesn't only respond to this from the outside, it must be doing this already. Exactly. So instead of, instead of looking for, um, for problems, the body is looking for problems at the molecular level, there must be systems to regulate the energy level in the body 24-7. Which you detect as molecular changes. Yes, which you detect, yes. Yes, Father. Yes. Okay, tell him to come behind the ashram, number 8, St. Jill's Street. Okay? It's a green colored door. I'll give him my number and I will guide him. Thank you. Sitting in the ashram. What, what is the Vedic physiology of the body? to start in the way that Chinese medicine describes meridians, and that's a beginning. Um, is there anything more than the chakras, so some other nice. system that we can, the nadis, yes. So first we recognize can, there are multiple levels of substance, different gradations, all overlapping and uh, sharing the same space. So the gross physical body 
has intermixed with it a subtler gradation and a subtler gradation and a subtler and on each there is an organization of things. So the nadis are on the immediate subtler grade which you cannot see with physical eyes or measure. But they are close enough to the physical that they can modify physical processes and they are detected as electrical activity. That's why you are able to detect nadi operation through electrical measurements but not find them by cutting the body. Because they are, they are inherently electrical in nature on the subtler grade. But you could go further subtle and this is the interesting thing. The substance at a subtler level has fundamental change in quality of space, time and form. Mm -hmm. So let me just map it this way, uh, roughly. Mm -hmm. Gross matter has rigidity of form in limited space and time. Two objects cannot share the same space. Okay? The moment you go to the level of pranic energy or of life force, you will find there is no more rigidity of form. You still have forms, you can see but they are fluid and they can intermingle without bumping into each other. So in your heart you have an emotion, I feel fear but I am happy. Okay? And they are not banging into each other, they are in the same space, they are sharing space. So this is the driver. Hello? Uh, hello? Ashram Pinnadi Road is there. Ashram Pinnadi is in Villa Street. Ange, Number actor or a pachi door. Number actor, Mango. And then Pache. Number actor, Pache door parango. Or in a pachi door. So the sense of space breaks down and distance is in terms of affinity of quality of energy. I like you, so I feel close to you even though you're far away physically. If I don't like you, you can sit next to me and be still. <laughs> So the sense of space is in terms of the quality of substance which is energetic and quality of energy. You shift one level up now to the domain which is mind awareness, mental consciousness. There, not only the space is already broken down, but the sense of time breaks down. So in your mind, you can shift back in time and daydream as if it's happening right now. You can shift into the future and daydream as if it's happening right now. You have access across space and time and there is no rigidity of form either. Thoughts can share the same space which are completely opposite. And uh, so, as you go into the subtler gradations of the body, the working of that substance is now completely different. It cannot be understood by a physical type process. You cannot apply the qualities of physical substance onto those grades. The chain of consciousness gives rise to a different space, time and form experience. They are more essential, less form. And so they can influence something which is more form, which can influence something which is rigidly form. And when you go back sufficiently, there's a pure template, which is indestructible, inherently, because it's not bound to form. And as a template, it supports your journey across various changes of form. Even though my body has grown bigger, the template of I as a mind idea is still pretty much the same. Though that can still evolve a little bit, because behind it, there is the, mo the most essential template which is me across space time. And that is growing, but is not bound to any inherently to any form. Now, once you understand this model, you will see as you go higher up, because you are more plastic, you can bind yourself to things more easily. So, we were discussing briefly yesterday this whole uh, phantom layer experience and the ability of the hand to attach to a rubber hand using the mirror experiment. You've seen a lot of those things. Or even having some, you have your uh, projection on your eyes with the camera somewhere else, looking at you from behind, okay, and you think you are behind yourself. Yeah. That's because what's happening, your mental body is inherently plastic and projects itself at the space where you are having this perception of you yourself. So the mental body is where the remote viewing is easiest. You can, because that's fluid, most fluid. If you go down to a denser level, you cannot shift out easily. But if you do shift out, you have the ability to move objects because you're at a closer level of density. So that's made this substance which they call uh, exoplasm. It's the substance which belongs to the gross body and the subtle body and is shared in between. It has the plasticity of the subtle body but the density of the gross and is attached to the gross substance and it is what sustains much of our life process. 
but by conscious will you can project it out to a degree that you can hope and move that object because it's a physical push in substance like that that density is enough that you can densify to make visible and give to it a shape with your mind because it's plastic mm -hmm. and you have a materialization mm -hmm. but it's drawing on your ectoplasm that's why you get drained through process mm -hmm. so people who do that using help of other beings they often use ectoplasm from other beings mm -hmm. and that's why the low level magic involves uh, animal sacrifice and things like that mm -hmm. using blood of animals because you're extracting the ectoplasm from them the it mm -hmm. gets pretty murky mm -hmm. but the low level beings are happy with that because it gives them access in human affairs to clear out the mm -hmm. whereas the higher beings will feel it filthy and just back off mm -hmm. and what happens to the practitioner if you enter in relation with a low being its type, its vibe begin to permeate into yours, you become like it. Mm -hmm. Until you and it are no more separate, you are possessed, you are living it, it has you. Yeah. You are a slave. Mm -hmm. Whereas the same process, spiritually we want to do with the divine consciousness. Mm -hmm. You want that permeation to be so that my narrow ego dissolves into the divine consciousness and the divine consciousness fills me and becomes me. So the, same. the same process is done at a lower level and that's why spiritually it is disastrous. Spiritually, Spiritually, it is disastrous disaster. to take that kind of a room for occult magic. Uh, and getting into the, see, once you get into the mechanism of it, all these things become obvious. Mm -hmm. So, will you say after um, the mind level, were you going to go to the seven other levels mm -hmm. as you were just describing, okay. from the, the density to the? So. First of all, you can just think of them as certain gradations. Yes. Which are there every day. But yes. if you look at the principles behind it, in order to have a complete cosmos, what puts, what makes it cosmos and not chaos? Yeah. <laughs> so central to it is this organizing principle which places everything in right relation to everything else. If there's a seed, <coughs> its relationship with the sprout is this sequence. And the sprout has a relationship with the plant, which has a relationship with the flower, which has a relationship with the fruit. Mm -hmm. But seed and fruit do not just bump into each other. Mm -hmm. So the sequencing and putting in the right relation of all infinite possibility of the divine consciousness is done by this organizing power, which is what Sri Rupinda called the super mind. Mm -hmm. You can call it mind of God or the creative power of God. Because at that level, knowledge and power of action are one. Mm -hmm. See, in our mind, I know, but I cannot do, because the willpower is different from my knowledge. Yes. But as you go up, they merge into a single movement. What I am, I become. That's how the divine manifests. So in the supramental consciousness, knowledge and will are really one movement. As they move into the domain of mind, they split and become two separate movements. And further down, even more finer distinctions. So in that creative energy, you can call it the mind of God, or the creative power of God, or the knowledge, Gnosis, the pure Gnosis. Uh, so that's one thing which is essential for the chaos to become cosmos. It holds all relations. Mm -hmm. You find in many old traditions this idea that God has already arranged everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. Which is interpreted by people to mean that, oh, everything is pre-programmed and we're just automatons. And you can't change your fate. But that's a wrong reading. This perfect relationship of all things is held. But the unfolding is completely free with those relationships. It is at a much deeper level that this has to be understood. So separate from this, before even this can happen, there are three higher levels, the Sat, Chit, and the Ananda, mm -hmm. which is a fundamental existence, that which is, which exists. If it doesn't exist, nothing can be. So that's a level which is just sheer existence, but formless, without conditioning, without limits, infinite one. Mm -hmm. That has then the power of awareness of knowing itself. Mm -hmm. And the character of its self-knowing is this one. These are the three first principles. Then comes the super mind, which then organizes all this infinite possibility. Mm -hmm. And then comes the mind, which separates out the possibilities, so that you can have a multiple experience of life and universe. Mm -hmm. And so the cosmic mind is where the division takes place. Behind it, the whole one is there, but the mind sets aside the oneness and puts forward the sense of separation. It's like I'm doing a puppet show. Mm -hmm. Each puppet I have to highlight as separate by hiding myself behind the curtain. So the oneness is hidden, so to say. Mm -hmm. But inherently in the mind process, you will see the oneness is implied. 
For example, if you have a problem, you're thinking for a, you're looking for a solution. How do you know when you've reached it? It's a very interesting question. Yes. Or if you There's ask someone, do you do you know George Williams? Uh -huh. You don't have to search the whole memory bank. Yes. You do. But I know I'm close to the solution, but it's not it. Yes. I know it feels like it, but it's not it. Where does that knowing come from? How do I know I should look for a solution in this direction and not that direction? Mm -hmm. So inherently in our mind's divided process, mm -hmm. supporting from behind is the super mind which knows it all. Mm -hmm. Its reflection in the mind is the intuition that says, ah, this is it, now I know I've got it. Mm -hmm. See? If it was not there, mind could not reach what it does. Yes. It would be like a computer which has uh, yeah. billions of yeah. bits of data and has to search it all to exactly. know which one fits. I think the Savantism is an example of the human potential. Whether Asab, people who are Savant. born as Savants, oh, Savant. okay. Savants in mathematics, calendars, music, or sometimes we have a bump on the head will induce this or a stroke. So the thing, the rationale for the Savantism is your surface mind is the one operating in pieces. Mm -hmm. Behind that, supporting it, is this larger mind yeah. which already has the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Between the two is this gap. The curtain. Now sometimes the curtain is partly exposed and then you have suddenly the extraordinary capacities and it's closed and suddenly you're dumb and incapable. Uh, the curtain in our case is primarily based on the biological substance into which our mind gets embedded. At the time when the mind connects to the brain and plugs into it, there's an enormous dulling effect. That's when you forget yourself. Mm -hmm. Forget your past life and your intention in taking birth, and you're this tiny little baby. I don't know what I am, I feel weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost all memory. But the more developed souls, they don't fully enter. They keep a part of the consciousness separate until a much later age when they can retain some imprint of the memory. Mm -hmm. So many of us would have memories like, I don't know, somewhere along this age, I had this awakening or something woke up in me and I knew this life was important. It was like a part held back, not fully lost in the brain identification, which popped up. And that was your guide or reference. But uh, if somehow this curtain can be removed, we will have access to all that. Each one of us will have access to our genius, which is there in all of us. And this can be done by a yogic process, where you sort of cut a hole through the curtain and begin to separate it. Or sometimes it happens in an accident where there's a brain damage, and the dulling effect of the brain is temporarily removed, but in an unbalanced way. Mm -hmm. So now I'm no more normal in my function, but I have access to this knowledge, so you have the seven piece. Seven yeah. But it's abnormal. And nature is trying to get to that through an organized path, yeah. rather than this broken uh, individual. But at least it's a clue for us Western scientists that such a thing exists. But again, it can be misinterpreted. Yeah. Science sees it as an accident happened and the brain now functions more efficiently. Yeah. It's the reverse, the brain has been removed. Yeah, the obstacle has been removed. Exactly. The veil has been So we have to see the brain more as a limiting device mm -hmm. rather than the device producing consciousness. It limits our infinite possibilities so that we can function as an individual. Mm -hmm. And the evolution is progressively refining and building those levels of organization so that we can access that now and continuate your individual experience. Would you, would you consider that, what is the organ that allows us to see, if it's not the brain? To see? Well, to experience. So we rely on our brains to operate in this through so dimension. In the yogic traditions, we speak of the mind as the sixth sense. So the five senses are plugged into the body, but who is actually experiencing? So your eyes are translated, light into electricity, your brain has processed electrical signals, but where, the experience, where does the experience of seeing and recognizing takes place in the mind, which is not brain, but which is plugged into brain, and therefore depends on the brain signals to give it the basic data. But it's plugged in only by habit, other layers of the mind are still free, and they do catch pieces all around, which pop up as suggestions or ideas within you, which you don't realize came from outside. So the actual seeing experience is always in the mind. So when you have an out-of-body experience, the physical body without the mind has only a very crude level of perception. Your mind, which has the sophisticated perception, can actually go out and see and experience everything. Because that's the real instrument. Mm -hmm. So 
you're calling it mind, so what, what is the mind? <laughs> so your individual mind is an organized form of a grade of consciousness which is itself cosmic. Mm -hmm. So at each level, you have cosmic, let's say, bands or strata of consciousness. On each level, evolution is creating a formation which allows the qualities of that consciousness to be organized and bound to the lower levels. You could have a disembodied mind, it would be pretty useless because it can never act on matter. But for life in matter, you have to have matter evolve sufficiently that it can embody the mind processes. And for that it had to develop material, physical material which is sensitive to mind pressure, which becomes the interface. Now you remove that material and suddenly I cannot access my mind, I go unconscious. Right? But the material is needed only as a support for the mind to remain embodied. If you remove the material, mind can still be disembodied and function, which often happens for people who are uh, mentally unstable. In dream state, they're normal. They get back into the body and they have this crazy behavior, etc. So much of what classes, classes as uh, schizophrenia mm -hmm. is only awakening of the subtle perceptions. <coughs> And you are seeing things which actually exist. Yes. And you have to learn to shut it out to become normal. Yes. So when the psychiatrist approaches it from this perspective, without any medication, you can get people free of schizophrenia by helping them to distinguish between those layers and this layer. Okay. And then choosing to stay stuck with this and close that. But in schizophrenia, often, you know, the perceptions are negative. They're negative to the ego. There's a strong ego process that takes mm -hmm. place there where they're only open So if That's why they have to participate. They must want to get free. Yes. That's good. Yes. Otherwise, we use medicines which just dull everything at that level, yeah. and so yeah. the access is as if blocked. No, we, we but then everything else, it. all your functions on that level are blocked. Also. Yeah. The British psychiatrist Arnie Lang, um, that was his belief that um, that people who have schizophrenia are waking up, and he felt that the best people to help treat them were people who were psychotic, were, had been called psychotic, but were able to distinguish because if only they have that subjective understanding of what the state is like. Mm -hmm. And all, all anyone else does is the psychiatrist is make sure they go back to sleep or there's just stress. Or somebody with that spiritual access. Yes. Yes. Equally without that yes. Yeah. So we have a few doctors, psychiatrists here who have worked in this way for schizophrenics. Really? And and interestingly one of them uh, experimented in certain extreme cases of possession mm -hmm. so that's another kind which classes as schizophrenia where a being actually hooks in and possesses you have to be able to remove them and that often requires a certain skill or an occult mm -hmm. ability mm -hmm. so this psychiatrist teamed up with tantrics who had that skill mm -hmm. so they had the mechan the technology to yes. evict the being in mm -hmm. their process mm -hmm. and he was sharing examples of how successful they were and in a certain case, the tantric walked into his clinic, looked at a particular patient and said, look on his arm, he must have this particular thing attached. Mm. And they found he had that. Mm. And that was the link point through which somebody was coming in. Mm -hmm. They removed that and freed the link and the person mm. was okay. Yeah. <laughs> and those tantrics are here as well? Uh, this man, he lives in Calcutta, but he comes to Calcutta. He shifts between the two. He, he meets the tantric. So we begin to see the outlines of uh, new vocabulary, broader, and expanded vocabulary, beyond that of elementary particles and <laughs> forces and electromagnetic fields. So have you, uh, have you vocabulary of, of the consciousness and the different layers of these consciousness. Yes. Have you written this perspective? I have spoken about it extensively. Mm -hmm. I have a book which is on integral education where some elements as relevant for children's education is represented but not as extensively mm -hmm. as I mean, If we were to transcribe this talk, sure. could you then put it and sure. get it back to you? Sure. This would be wonderful to have. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We 
didn't get into the physics of key energy, but we'll keep it for next time. Yes. Save that for next time. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you, Shivaji. Thank you so much. Oh. So much wisdom. Oh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.